Good morning. Welcome, everyone, to the Wilson Center. My name is Eddie Acevedo, and I am the chief of staff here in the center. We're very honored to have all of you here today for a very special conversation. Um, as you may know, Congress established the Wilson Center some five decades ago for the purpose, in their words, of strengthening the fruitful relationship between the world of learning and the world of public affairs. What that means is that we are congressionally chartered, scholarship driven, and fiercely nonpartisan. Our focus is independent analysis, and our purpose is developing options and recommendations for policymakers. And this brings us to this morning's conversation regarding the intersection of government, the private sector, and foreign affairs. To open it up, I would like to introduce a very special person here at the Wilson Center. He has been a U.S. ambassador to Honduras, Mexico, the Philippines, the U.N., and Iraq. In the Foreign Service, if you are what we call the trifecta, which is you're an ambassador three times, that's a very special honor. But this individual went above and beyond. He was also the first director of the National Intelligence under President George W. Bush and also served as Deputy Secretary of State. Please welcome Ambassador John Negroponte. Thank you very much, Eddie. President Duque, good morning. <laughs> it's wonderful to have you here. And thank you for your presence. Of course, I don't think Mr. Duque in this group needs uh, extensive introduction. He, of course, was president uh, of Colombia uh, at one point in his distinguished career. Now he is a distinguished fellow uh, here at the Woodrow Wilson Center and uh, has uh, been actively involved in the various programs that take place here. So thank you very much for your presence. I want to take a little bit more time since he's a new member of the uh, Global Advisory Committee of Woodrow Wilson Center uh, to introduce uh, George Logothetis, who is the executive chairman of the Libra Group, a privately owned global business group with assets and operations in nearly uh, 60 countries. I've known George for quite a while. I can't really count <coughs> back now. It must be uh, more than uh, 10 or 15 years. Uh, met him in New York, uh, where he uh, has the headquarters of his uh, business, but uh, they are truly global in nature. They encompass, uh, the Libra Group encompasses 20 businesses predominantly focused on aerospace, renewable energy, maritime, real estate, hospitality, and other diversified investments. But I think what makes George very special is that he's also the founder and chairman of the group's uh, sister organization, which is called Libra uh, Philanthropies. George is a true uh, philanthropist. Libra Philanthropies is an independent 501c3 that includes 10 different philanthropic uh, initiatives, uh, which includes social impact programs, strategic giving, and independent nonprofits supporting over, uh, supporting millions of people uh, around the world. Uh, George, and this is a kind of a unique aspect of his career, he's the co-chairman of the Leadership Council of a forum in New York which is called Concordia, based in New York. It, uh, its uh, premier meeting every year is at the time of the general debate uh, at the United Nations, the third week of, uh, of September. And I, he has succeeded since 2011 uh, in uh, nurturing this organization to become really, I would say, one of the two premier forums in New York at the time of the General Assembly, one being Concordia, the other being the Clinton uh, Global uh, Initiative. And uh, the focus uh, of Concordia, very much related to today's topic, is to promote, uh, among other things, uh, public-private uh, uh, partnerships. 
Uh, George is also a uh, member of the board of directors of President Barack Obama's My Brother's uh, Keeper, among other uh, important organizations. And again, something I really would like to highlight, in, in 2013, George and his wife, Nitzia Logothetis, founded the Seleni Institute, an independently run clinic and nonprofit organization which supports individuals and families who have me mental and emotional uh, health issues uh, during uh, family building years, especially uh, after uh, pregnancy. And uh, Nitzia herself, George's wife, is one of the psychologists practicing uh, at that very institute. So I think you have a very well-rounded and interesting gentleman here with you today uh, to talk with uh, President Duque, Duque, who I think really does have a lot of experience in the whole area of public-private uh, relationships. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Ambassador. Thank you so much, Ambassador Negroponte. It's always a pleasure to see you. Thank you so much, Eddie. George, welcome to the Woodrow Wilson Center. Welcome to uh, this amazing Think and Do Tank here in D.C. that was named on behalf of Woodrow Wilson, a leader that believed in peace, in democracy, and that worked very hard to creating an international governance for global peace. I am very pleased to be here this morning with you, and I also want to welcome you to the Global Advisory Council of the Woodrow Wilson Center. This is an event where we're going to talk about geopolitics and the private sector, but we're also going to talk about philanthropy. And um, as Ambassador Negroponte pointed out, pointed out in his introduction, when we see what you have achieved in life, you will see a lot of success stories, challenging times. You took uh, the leadership of Lamar uh, Maritime uh, when you were 19. At 28, you had turned it into Libra Group. Now you have presence in 60 countries. And if there's one word that defines you is optimism. When many people see very gloomy pictures, you're always the one who's making the big bet. And that has been a significant part of your success. You have also endured many tests uh, in your life, and we're going to talk about that. But I just want to start with one thing. We have a global panorama full of challenges and conflicts, and many people love to paint the, the, the gloomy picture of the world. What makes George Logotetis so optimistic, and what makes George Logotetis so optimistic in terms of investing, but also working philanthropically in the Global South? Well, you've set the bar very high, both of you. Uh, so thank you for that. And thank you, Mr. Ambassador. And thank you for your friendship with my father-in-law, which he cherished a lot. Uh, Mr. President, thank you for everything that you've done, do, and will do. Um, thank you for hosting us in Cartagena last week. Uh, this helped change the life of my family from within, as you know. Um, before I answer the question, I just want to say one thing. As I was coming here, um, driving down. I came to Washington, D.C. 20 years ago this month for the first time. And life is a funny thing, as you know. Uh, known unknowns, unknown unknowns. What did I do that first time I came here? I went to Arlington National Cemetery. It was my first time to the rebirth of democracy. Birth in Greece, rebirth in the United States. And I watched the changing of the guard when I was 29 years old, 20 years ago this month. Changing the guard is in front of the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. The tomb of the Unknown Soldier mm -hmm. has the first dead soldiers from World War I. World War I was won by Woodrow Wilson. And here we are at the Woodrow Wilson Center. And as I'm sitting there reflecting on life, I think to myself, you know, what was my grandfather doing when he was my age to the week? I started to play back. And I thought, my goodness, he was in El Alamein, in a tank, firing 
at people that he didn't know, killing. And it put life into perspective for me. So you, you're there, and I would urge anyone that has not been to Arlington to go, and you, you seek solace and gratitude and thanks be to God for us being blessed with the freedoms that we did not earn ourselves that were granted to us by people that came before us. And here we are 20 years later at the Woodrow Wilson Center with the former president of Columbia talking about optimism and I would add gratitude as well. So that's what, this, is a ver this is quite special for me to be here. <laughs> that's what Thank I want to so say, much, okay? Right. Thank you. Optimism. Well, Mr. President, the first memory I have of being alive in this world is dying in an intensive care unit at the age of two and a half. It, I had meningitis, it was very bad, it was uh, lethal, I was not expected to survive. Um, the odds were against little Georgie boy. My parents were in a distraught state, obviously, as they would be. By the grace of God and by the luck of the draw, I survived. But what it did for me was many things. It created a 34-year-long health crisis that was invisible to the world but very visible to me, very visible to my mother, very visible to my family. And I would spend many, many weeks of every year unwell. And I don't mean unwell, oh, I have a cold. No, I mean unwell, pneumonia, whooping cough, uh, hospital, immune system deficiencies. I never felt unhappy about it. It wasn't something that I looked at. At the time, you don't know what you don't know. If you're five years old and you spend your life going to hospital, you have no perspective. What I knew is I was loved by many people. And that unconditional love that was injected into the soul and the, the body and the organism of that child, um, I think made me optimistic. Um, I think that you can suffer and you can endure in life and you can go through great pains and great tragedies. But if you have love, gratitude, a reflection of history, um, you can still be optimistic. And at the end of the day, it is a choice that we make to be optimistic or pessimistic. And I prefer to be optimistic, just like you do. It's a, it's a happier life. At the end of the day, if you, if, you, if you live with gratitude, you have the seeds of happiness. If you have ingratitude, you can't be happy. How many, people, how many happy people do you know that wake up and are ungrateful? Oh, what I don't have, or what I, what I, what I, not what I would like to have, or what I'm happy to compete to attain, but what I don't have as opposed to being grateful for what one does have and fighting in the correct way to attain what one doesn't have. So that is a very powerful reflection, but that takes me to something related to your roots mm -hmm. and your beliefs. Yeah. You were born in the UK, but your you. family is Greek. Yes. You carry the Greek principles on a permanent basis, and those who, like me, are your friends, always listen to one word that you love to, to put in every conversation regarding politics, friendship, uh, philanthropy, uh, investment, and it's philotimos. <laughs> what does philotimos means to you and how would you define philotimos for this group that is with us today and the people that are watching us online as a guiding principle for building successful private public sector relationships? Uh, well, thank you for recognizing it, um, for we cannot be grateful for what we're not aware, right? Um, so philotimo, is, there's no literal translation from Greek into English. It's, uh, the best translation technically is the love of honor. It is giving more than you get. It is loving life. It is treating people with respect, even if you are not treated with respect. It is being decent and taking pride in being decent. It is overcoming adversity with a smile on your face. It is practicing philanthropy in the ancient way. The ancient way is a more profound way, I think. Philanthropos, philos ton anthropon, friend of man, friend of humanity. So that is giving without expecting to get. It is governing your anger with empathy. So we all get angry. We're not human if we don't get angry. But what do we do with the anger? Do we use it as a weapon for good or do we use it as a seed for bitterness? It's a choice we make, right? We, 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 we still have the agency over self. No one can take that away from us. At the end of the day, as I often like to say, one of the things I learned growing up with all these medical problems was that we choose how to react to something. 
It doesn't mean we're a robot, right? Um, it doesn't mean it's difficult, that it's easy, but we elect how to respond to something. Do we react with hope? Do we try and find the good and the bad? Or do we react with despair? Do we allow the seeds of discontentment to fill us up? <laughs> or the flowers of gratitude? What's it gonna be? Hope is free. It's free. No one can take that from us. And I read this the first time when I read Man's Search for Meaning, Viktor Frankl, which we talked about last week, yes. right? And his friends, he knew he, could, he had predictive capability over when his friends were going to die in the camp in Auschwitz because the hope would go out of their eyes. And he could predict that. So, you know, whenever we, I mean, what is a life without the stress? It's not a life, right? I mean, what is it, especially if you are ambitious and you want to progress in life and you want to, you know, assume, um, if you want to become the best version of yourself, like you, well, it was easy. <laughs> Come on. To come back from uh, the United States after 14 years here in 2014, go to Colombia, and four years later become the youngest president, and then govern a country with uh, wisdom, fierceness, tour de force when required, but empathy, that's not easy. That's a choice. George, optimism, philotimos, and I've asked you this many times. You took the head of a family business at 19, with three vessels, 10 years later, you had turned the family business into a global organization. And obviously, uh, Libra continues to explore new ventures, new sectors. But I've asked you, tell me about some of the uh, recipes for success. <laughs> and you always mention three. And I can tell it by looking at, at your team this morning. You said, empower women, empower young people and empower the underdog. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, well, Mr. President, uh, I was blessed as George to have been cursed with all the sicknesses, and you tend to see through people when you suffer that way, in a clearer way, point one. Point two, you know, my parents came from nothing. My dad grew up in East Africa. He was an immigrant. A Greek immigrant. My, fa my mother grew up in Wales, another Greek immigrant. It's a story that the ambassador knows very well. We're all immigrants. If you look at the history of the Greek people, they're always fleeing. The island that we come from, always running. You go from this place to this place, then you get attacked. So that genetic predisposition to be resilient and to endure pain uh, resides in this gentleman's soul, and I believe resides in my soul too and my family. We were looked down upon. Man, don't look down at us. <laughs> look at us. Don't look down at people. You know this well. We're all children of God. We're all human beings. We all have our potential. Sometimes it's silent for the most part. So we were looked down upon where we grew up for various reasons. My parents are decent people. They worked hard in life. Nothing was easy for them to go from being an immigrant from what was then Tanganyika to creating a shipping company. Yeah, it sounds glamorous until you try and do it. No, it's glamorous, right? So that was how we were brought up. Very tight, tight family with a purpose that was greater than self. Look at us. It's quite simple, right? So I think when you work for something you believe in that is deeper than the attainment of material wealth, you have a renewable energy that is like a machine that you can press the button and, and, uh, and it never ends, right? As long as you take care of yourself, right? So, you know, if I run through these, uh, empower women, I mean, it's, it's almost, I'm almost embarrassed to say it now because life has moved on. Um, and this was, let's say, perhaps more applicable maybe 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago. I, I, I'm almost getting to the point where, to rephrase that, to empower leaders of tomorrow. <laughs> Woman or man, there's no, you know, it's a meritocracy. We try in our organization to run it meritocracy. And for people that are merit worthy, whether a man, a woman, a Chinese, a Greek, a, what, Colombian, whatever, they move forward. And what we've tried to do is create an organization where people can become the best version of themselves. It's not easy. <laughs> Nothing of real value is easy at the end of the day. 
And this is something you know very well. The trick is to make it look easy. <laughs> Doesn't mean it is. <laughs> it means it looks easy. So that's point one. Point two, I was empowered when I was a teenager. So I know what young people are capable of. I, I did it. I, you know, I, I remember you know, when I was a kid being given these responsibilities by my parents, um, working with my dad for many years. I still work with my dad. Every day in the morning, first call is to my dad, 32 years later. You don't really grow unless you are placed with a mantle of responsibility on you. You can read as many books as you want, but until you are responsible for decisions, the, 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 there is some invisible ceiling of real growth. So we put empowerment onto people. And th that's the two sides of the coin, right? Because it's a more risky approach. And we've made many failures. We don't have a failures page on Libra yet. <laughs> but we've had many failures. But we react quickly to them. And we adapt nimbly. And then in terms of empower the underdog, you know, uh, I, you know I, I, I have this, uh, this uh, sense. When I meet people, I default to what they can be. Not what they are. What can you be? And not everyone reaches that position. And it can be as much a liability, disappointment, failure, as it can be a success. Where you have people that become the absolute abject best version of themselves. Es un proceso. George, but you have, I mean, we, we have talked about your optimism, the philotimos, those three rules that have guided you. But you're also a, a traveler. You've been to multiple countries. You've talked with many leaders. And something that is always challenging uh, with you is that you're an expert in body language. <laughs> so when you meet uh, George, uh, you can be very quickly analyzed uh, based on, on your body language. You are yeah. too. Man. <laughs> <laughs> Without a training. Yes. Uh, by, by Natural by, training. By, by <laughs> feeling. Uh, maybe some of the scars in life that, that can, can give you that, that sense. But, but let me ask you this. You've... You've traveled around the world. You have all these values. You're looking always at investment opportunities, philanthropic opportunities. What are the geopolitical challenges of today that keep you awake at night? Um, there's an invisible war going on between elements of the West and elements of the East. That invisible war has been invisible to most people for some decades now because it's been fought through cyber through intelligence services, trade policy, and the like. All of a sudden, there are now two wars on the Western front, or the Eastern front, excuse me, of the Western world. So all of a sudden, it's gone from invisible to visible. People being killed, slaughtered, uh, death. Uh, the world was progressing so well for so many decades. Wars had come down, conflict had come down, and all of a sudden, conflict is back. Um, I would just say we should be very grateful for the liberal democracies of the West, for the defense of the West, for the values that we cherish. Having been to, in the 1990s, to see and feel the residue of communism, man, you can't be what you want to be. Uh, you know, I, you, you, I'm not going to mention countries. You know which countries they are. So Ivan wants to be president. No, Ivan will be a teacher. No, I don't want to be a teacher. No, you will be a teacher. So things that are very basic that we take for complete granted uh, because we didn't earn those freedoms. Those freedoms were passed to us by people that came before us. Um, and you go to Arlington Cemetery and you see it live. And people that sacrificed, that made the ultimate sacrifice to give us these freedoms, to be what we want to be, to become the best version of ourselves if we elect to so you know is the war is this war going to get out of control uh, maybe uh, it depends on the decisions that are taken at the highest level it's almost like there is a visible clash of civilizations playing out now um you know uh, i traveled to the region as you know a few weeks ago what i saw and heard was uh, was uh, tortured tortures one soul what happened Um, so leadership counts, and gratitude counts, and, and awareness of history, understanding what people endured to, like I say, I've said this so many times, give us the freedoms that we now possess, that we didn't earn. We are protecting them. We're not creating them. 
George, but you mentioned democracy and you mentioned liberal democracy. It's a global geopolitical challenge, and many people are talking about a democracy deficit. So to put it in numbers, 70% of the people in the planet today as we speak are governed in, by authoritarian regimes. The sad part of that story is that 15 years ago it was 48%. We have seen more than 10 coup d'etats in Africa. We have seen uh, democracies turn into dictocracies and then into dictatorships. And many people take democracy for granted. Many people maybe see democracy as health. So when you have it, you take it for granted. When you see it threatened, uh, you want to look uh, with all your energies to recover it. You have given democracy a starting role in your vision, but also you're pushing forward in your philanthropic uh, endeavors to protect democracy. How do you want that to be accomplished? What, how, how would you love to, to get more people's attention to protect democracy globally? Well, I think, first of all, we can't have fullest protection of what we are not fullest aware of. So raising awareness is very important. Uh, um, you know, education. I mean, if, if democracy fails, if we live in a misinformation state, then it doesn't work. Um, I think, you know, this is something we've obviously discussed together many, many times, and it's something we both believe in. And I'd like to think that, you know, over the next decades, we are warriors, brothers, fighting to protect democracy. Um, you know, we are going to be setting up a program that is a, has specificity with regards to the protection and the uh, raising the awareness of what it really is, because it's almost become a cheapened word. Mm -hmm. Until you go to Arlington, until you stand by and you watch the, 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 the changing of the guard, until you recognize that the United States saved the world three times in the last 110 years. First World War, Second World War, Cold War. So I, I go back to understanding history. Um, Often in life, uh, the greatest liability from within a tribe can be the lack of perspective from without that tribe. So, for example, where were we last week? We were in Granitas de Paz. Mm -hmm. okay? This was a very moving experience that we both had. And if you go back to that two-minute period when you had the five young kids talking in front of 50, 60 people about what their history is, where they've come from, how they've evolved, how they've gone from being 13-year-olds with guns to reformed 13-year-olds with guns. Taking them out of that village and bringing them to It Takes Courage in Panama, that is exposure. That is a, a, a you are arming people with gratitude. You're arming people with a force of nature, tour de force. So... Exposure, awareness, gratitude, uh, understanding, you know, being aware that our lives are more invisibly controlled through algorithms than we even realize. How do we take information in? You know, if, 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 uh, if we, you know, you should go to Nitya's Instagram feed. It's all about uh, babies and postpartum depression, but that's all she gets. So that's a limitation in the ways, unless she's aware of it and she makes active measures to diversify that. She is aware, but many people are not. So in many ways, Ivan, we are, we are more visibly connected than ever, but we are also more invisibly disconnected than ever. So um, again, it starts with, with great gratitude, being aware, me standing in front of the changing the guard and thinking, my God, my grandfather was 29 years old when I was 29 years old in a goddamn tank firing. And you know something interesting? In the 1990s, uh, when I was the head of our shipping business, it was, all, it was what we had at the time, I had a meeting in Germany in the late 1990s with a banker. And this banker, you know, in those days, one couldn't really talk about the Second World War with a German. It was, it was different than it is today. So I plucked up the courage to discuss with this German banker who ended up becoming my very good friend. He ended up becoming the CEO of Lomar. He ended up dying prematurely. He ended up with a balcony 
at the United States Institute of Peace named after him. This started 20 years ago, 25 years ago. I said, Achim, let's just take a step back, man. My grandfather was in a tank in El Alamein. He's like, George, my grandfather was in El Alamein too. I said, I am unbelievable, man. So here we are today. I'm talking, I'm trying to get money from your bank. And our grandparents were shooting against each other to kill each other. They didn't even know who they were. Probably if they met each other, they'd become friends. So that's where the, the, the importance of history and understanding the roots of it all are so important. We can't fix what we're not aware of, Ivan. But you also, you have also mentioned something that is very important in the context of geopolitics and democracy mm -hmm. as a challenge. But you mentioned something, the power of algorithms. We're going to have in 2024 maybe the year uh, with more people going to the ballots ever in times of manipulated algorithms, in times of misinformation and the power of misinformation. But you're also a believer and an optimistic about the usage of technology for humanity. But I want to maybe drop something for your consideration and, and, and discussion that we've talked many times. Do you think artificial intelligence can at some point affect with the flow of misinformation and manipulated algorithms affect democracy and make it artificial democracy by trying to infuriate people and not allowing the power of the human for the liberty to choose? Uh, I f fully agreed, agree with you, and, and you are the co you created and coined that term. Um, it's a superpower today in the wrong hands, and you know uh, the enemies of the Western world train up people that are very smart, put them into a room, give them a mandate. And you have people with an IQ of 160. Uh, pretending to be a young woman from uh, Iowa. <laughs> and it's very convincing. And people don't know what they don't know. Um, so I think it's a real danger. And you go into, I think also one other point to make is that COVID had many visible effects, which are clear, but also invisible effects, in that COVID severed human interaction in an artificial way. So, you know, the reconstitution of social interaction is different today than it was before COVID. It's just somehow different. It's like technology took a disproportionate mortgage over us without us even realizing because of COVID. From as simple as my kids, they don't go to school. So from Monday to Tuesday, they have to go online. So all of a sudden, the nine-year-old and the six-year-old and the 12-year-old's brain is online as opposed to interaction. And I think that One of the reasons that uh, conflict reduced in the last decades, as a general tone, not to say there weren't conflicts, but as a trend, because, you know, you could put the U.S. Secretary of State on a plane and immediately go from A to B and uh, uh, mitigate or work or negotiate, as opposed to 50, 100 years ago, where that was much harder to do. But with the almost overnight injection of disproportionate algorithmic influence, social interaction is cut. And sometimes as humans, we, de fact, we default to the negative, right? Uh, it's easier to be fearful than hopeful. I mean, to be hopeful you, requires effort. You, you have to fight for it. We default to fear because we're evolutionarily built that way. If we weren't defaulting to fear, maybe, I don't know, the chimpanzees would have won <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and it wouldn't be humans. Um, I think it's a, it's a who writes the algorithms. Who writes them and uh, governs and that's also where the liberal democracies of the West have huge vulnerabilities because we are more naked than authoritarian regimes around the world um, you know it's through that nakedness that innovation gets uh, created that you can become as I said the best version of oneself that one can progress in life that if you want to be president you can be president you're not told to be a whatever you know whatever you don't want to be You, you want to go from New York to Washington, you get in a car and you drive there. Not 20, 30 years ago in certain countries, you need a permit to go from A to B from the mayor of, your, of where you live. So, but there's always, I would also qualify it by saying every generation has its traumas, its missions to overcome, the fight between good and bad, 
good and evil. But if we consider that the democracy deficit is a major geopolitical challenge, if we consider that also the wrong use of many technologies can harm democracy, but we also know that it's an essential part of democracy is having a, a free enterprise, having freedom of, of economic endeavors. What do you think is the role that the private sector should play in this panorama? Hmm. What can the private sector do to protect democracy? What can the private sector do to prevent uh, some fatal projections of conflict that can be prevented? How, how would you define that role of the private sector in the context we live? Because I, I had an experience a couple of years ago. I was invited to give a, a speech at a, at a conference. And I remember that there were about 1,000 entrepreneurs. And I asked them, how many of you have spoken with your employees about democracy and about the challenges for democracy? And maybe two people raised their hands. What's the role the private sector should play in this? Well, I think, first of all, to be aware. Uh, second, to play a role. I mean, I'm saying the obvious here, right? But without awareness and active awareness, we, 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 where do we even begin, right? Um, I think that's number one. Number two, the private sector de facto is more nimble than the public sector, okay? Um, you know, the public sector's role, governance, rules, put the parameters in, leadership, military, defense, um, but I've seen the private sector be in so many ways much more efficient than the public sector when it acts with specificity and selflessly. And it goes back to philotimo and philanthropy, right? Um, when is enough enough? Mm -hmm. We had this uh, philosophical debate uh, last week extensively, right? Um, you know, uh, awareness. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, going back to history, uh, reading, you know, how, how even teaching parents about the dangers of social media to create awareness. I mean, you know, it, it, it hurts me when I go to a dinner and I see a family of six people on the phones. No, speak to each other. <laughs> you are severing the human connection. And that will have, it's a visible thing that will have invisible impacts. So it's almost like a dehumanization approach that has happened. And I think, you know, sponsoring programs, leading by example. You know, I, I, one of the things, uh, uh, Mr. President, that I as, as George and we as our organization are very proud of is the work that we did in Greece during the Greek crisis as a private company. You know, Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? <laughs> well, you know, it started by being angry with how Greeks were viewed. Because uh, what we would see is f people full of potential. Is what I said before that f for me, I look at people and default to what they can be. So I, I see all, I see this sort of uh, belief deficit that was going on, especially with the young people, and the the lackadaisical approach that was being taken by other people of prominence. And when it comes to giving, yes, money is one thing, but in some ways, more powerful than money is example, is advice, is leadership, is belief. I mean, if there's a deficit of belief, okay, put money in, but the money can get lost in the river of nothingness. If you put belief in and you put a few drops of belief, all of a sudden you change the course of the river. So, for example, we set up our internship program. And I know we have ex-interns, maybe current interns, I don't know, in the audience here today, because we were angry. And we governed that anger with empathy and with some wisdom, hopefully, instead of with bitterness and with resentment. So again, it goes back to the optimistic approach. That program today is a program that is global, that takes, you know, when one of my proud moments when I came to Colombia in December to, for the foundation launch was just before the foundation launch, there were meetings in your foundation. And one of the meetings was with 32, right? You told me the other day, 32 current and former interns of our organization from Colombia. Yeah, I remember that. It was a wonderful moment, right? Now, it was, that was a program that was born from anger, and it was born from the injustice of being looked down upon and resenting that. So that's one example of how the private sector in a country can help change the education of that nation by bringing people out of the country, where the country at the time was full of social and economic oppression, empowering them, showing them another way, and then sending them back. 
And today the program takes 80 kids a year. That's a, that's a, a beautiful, beautiful example. And I always get not only motivated, but I always have a, a personal impact when I see those stories and those people that have changed their lives. I got a message that we are getting to a few minutes, but let me ask you three things rapidly, George. I'll go scale by scale. <laughs> First one, I love what you have in your hands. You have uh, the aseguranzas. This is something that many Colombians have, and these are tied by the Kogis, the, the uh, indigenous communities in the Sierra Nevada of Santa Marta. And the Mamos and, and the Kogis have worked in multiple ways. And uh, the old guard, the Mamos, our older brothers, as they are called, they met with you and they met with uh, Libra. And they were convinced to work together in renewable energy. Mm -hmm. For me, that was an, a very uh, a beautiful story because they decided to get in business with a concept that has driven you all the time doing good and doing well. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that experience and how that work with indigenous communities sure. has become a reference model for Libra and a way of empowering local indigenous communities for new technologies. Well, first of all, thank you for your help on this matter. Um, we all need help, right? We all need heroes. Everyone needs a hero. Um, so thank you. Secondly, uh, how did we get there? Because this is an indigenous community, you know, that um, it's very hard for uh, people to, they don't trust people. How did we gain their trust? Over years, uh, by explaining the ancient values that we try to espouse, which are the same as theirs. How did I get these? Because Danilo, our friend, mm -hmm. who very passed sadly away. passed away, saving young kids, right? And Mamu Camilo mm -hmm. came to my office and we had like a two or three hour ceremony. And it was very interesting for many reasons, as you can imagine. But the most interesting for me was it was the only time in my life we've had double translation. So English to Spanish, Spanish to Iku. Equal to Spanish, Spanish to English. And so, and so even saying, hello, good morning, how are you, took two minutes, <laughs> right? Um, they are very deep people. Uh, we are very proud of making the abnormal look easy, making the impossible look easy. It's not easy, but it looks easy. And uh, it's one of our partnerships. And it led to another partnership, Mr. President, in Canada, where we are building through another company of our group, a 100 megawatt facility in Saskatchewan, which is the largest PPA that the government in Canada has given for 10 years. And we have a minority partner that is a tribal nation up there. In December, I went to visit a tribal nation in Long Island. We then invited some of the kids to come and meet us, and we held a career day for them. I mean, you know, we need to always diversify what we learn how we take in information. If we, if we are passive and we just rely on what is fed to us by the, by the algorithm, we're going to be invisibly contained in the way that we don't appreciate. So what we try and do in our group, and by its very nature, is get competing information, different cultures, different industries. So how do you think about the space business versus how do you think about the joint venture with the Arhuacos tribe in, in Sierra Nevada versus uh, uh, real estate? And, and it also preserves mental agility. This sure. guy, he was very moving, man, you know, when he, when he did this. And it's, it's very uh, sad that he's gone. As we know well, everything's fine, blink, and then it's not fine. Well, that was a beautiful story with, with, with Danilo and with the community. And for me, it has been one of the most successful stories of the private sector working with indigenous communities in Colombia. But let me also change uh, uh, the topic you started in shipping, and now you're thinking outer space. So tell us so cool. a, a, about what's, what, what, what's, <laughs> what's, what's your next bet on, on aerospace industry. Uh, so, uh, you know, we launched our space business about, 11, about nine months ago. Um, I need to talk to you about Colombia, actually, because there's talk about putting a ground station in Colombia, mm -hmm. which is one of your old initiatives. You see, I received a briefing this morning. <laughs> Talk to Ivan about this. Um, look, 
why did we do this space leasing business, which sounds harebrained? Because many businesses of our group are leasing businesses. What is a shipping business? You own the ship, you lease the ship, right? What is an, a helicopter business? You own the helicopter, you lease the helicopter. What is energy? You own the energy plant, you lease the electricity. And then one day we were having a, a, a meeting in, uh, with, uh, with some of the uh, lionesses of Libra, as I like to call them, right? And something just went off in my brain that there is no space leasing business in the world. I said, and I said to them, I said to this lady, Fedra, I said, Fedra, is there a space leasing business in the world? And, and, and this all came about because I'd asked her to go to the West Coast to think about innovation and to suck in new ideas. And, and she's like, George, I don't know. I said, go and find out, come back in one or two days and tell me yes or no. And if there is not, we'll do it. Because one day there will be, right? And, and talk about a bottomless pit of opportunity, right? I mean, this is the definition of that. So we started with ground stations. We have three that are being built around the world. Actually, two are built and one we're announcing now, actually, in Sweden. And there's one more to come, maybe Colombia. We're also talking about satellites and maybe eventually spaceports. And, you know, man, I'm in a meeting like six months ago and someone says, <laughs> talking about spaceports in India. I'm like, hold on a second, man, just, just roll that back. Can you say that again? <laughs> a, what is a spaceport, please? <laughs> Keep it simple for me. Keep it at five-year-old language. Um, B, you know, what? <laughs> really? <laughs> so space is not just up in space. There's a whole industry on the ground, launch equipment, uh, ground stations uh, and the like. There's no leasing company. So space companies basically have to raise capital at their holding company, which is dilutive, as opposed to saying, okay, look, here's a leasing company. Let us sell this equipment and lease it back. And uh, just like a plane, every plane you get on, 60% of all the planes are not owned by the airlines. But that's because there was a guy called Steve Harsey 50 years ago that set up the aviation leasing business. That sounds so cool, but it's not easy. Well, <laughs> pretty easy. Challenging and interesting, and since we're about to conclude, George, yeah. uh, Kira always shows me that <laughs> when I when I you know I, I start getting more more uh, emotional about the conversation, we, we, when we see that five minutes, two minutes yeah. and over, game over. But let me finish with this question: We have shared uh, opinions about many global leaders and historical figures. We have a, a great admiration for Winston Churchill. We've talked about FDR many times. But you have joined now the Woodrow Wilson Center Global Advisory Council. Mm -hmm. You're here. You're going to work with this amazing platform to defend values and principles. My last question. When you think about Woodrow Wilson, what comes to your mind? He defended the West and won the war. And a very difficult decision to take. To issue order to send young men from all over this country to defend democracy and the freedoms of the West a world away, knowing that many of them would come back in coffins. But if he hadn't done that, if he hadn't done that, when the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk was signed and Germany, having gotten Lenin through into Russia, having brought down Russia, having made peace, they sent two million men on a train from the Eastern Front to the Western Front. And if the American soldiers had not come, the West would have ended, as we know it. Point one. Point two, as to end. You want to end on a motion? One day you'll come to Long Island. Okay? And when you come, I will take you to the park where we would take our children when they were young. They don't go to the park anymore, right? But they did one, <laughs> once upon a time. And we would go every weekend. It's a beautiful park. There's geese around. It's sunny. Beautiful. Next to the park is the memorial for all the soldiers who died in the First World War from Southampton Village. Every time we went to the park, after the park, we'd say, right, boys and girl, we're going to go and pay our respects. And you see all the names of these young men. So what has it got to do to some guy, Joe Adams, who wakes up one day in May of 2000, 1917, draft papers. And he goes on board the Britannic, he gets on the ship in New York, and he goes off to the, and he finds himself in hell. And he comes back in a coffin. What a decision to take for Woodrow Wilson. But had he not taken that decision, we wouldn't be sitting here today with the freedoms that I, we've discussed so many times that we did not earn. What, a, what an amazing way to define it, George. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, George Logotetes, <laughs> give him a big round of applause. Thank you so much for being at the Thank Woodrow you, Wilson man. Center.
Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you.